Well, good afternoon uh, and welcome to this webinar, the sixth that FIFAC has organised. Uh, I am Angela Booth and your moderator for today. I'm an animal nutritionist by training and currently Director of Responsibility for AB Agri, which is a UK based animal nutrition business um, that operates globally. Uh, I'm also chair of the FIFAC Feed Safety Management Committee and hence my role with you today. Uh, and perhaps just first, some housekeeping points. Um, there is a Q&A, please use the Q&A channel for your questions. There is also a chat, but please use that for your comments and not for questions. As you may have noted, we are recording the event um, this afternoon and presentations will also available. And just also um, to note that we will run for one hour and 45 minutes. So with no further ado, may I introduce um, Ashburn Bursting um, to welcome you. Ashburn is the current FIFAC president. He is also a director of DeCofo in Denmark and chair of the Danish Bioeconomy Panel. And over to you, Ashburn. Thank you, Angela, for your introduction. Dear participants, also from my side, I welcome you to this FIFAC webinar about circular feed. When FIFAC started a few months ago, putting together the ideas for a webinar about circular feed, we were thinking of a general sustainable feed production context, looking for ways to become more resource efficient to anticipate future, demand of feed production and lower environmental footprints. There is a new reality now. Of course, we have to deal with it. We are in a crisis. But it only makes this webinar about circular feed even more relevant. While we are doing our utmost to address the urgent situation of feed security, we must on a parallel track look in towards the long-term perspective. The key question today for the webinar is how we strategically stimulate the EU feed autonomy by making more use of alternative nutrients and resources that can have a purpose in animal nutrition for food producing animals. Animal nutrition science and feed processing technology has always played their role in the valorization of co-products and nutrient recovery. And we are certainly using all this, what is available. But if we are asked to reach the next level, we must look beyond the boundaries of the existing EU regulatory framework. We cannot afford to not take into account the capacities of what modern innovative technologies and applied science can bring. The amount of arable land in the EU is limited. The expansion of arable land within the EU dedicated to animal feed production only is unlikely. We will need to cr be creative and hear from potential suppliers what is possible in terms of safe nutrient recovery new high yielding biomass crops and new refining processes. Next slide, please. FIFAC understands that this is also the challenge that the EU farm to fork strategy put to us. The mission is to find more alternative feed ingredients that can help to tackle import dependency and contribute to a sustainable food, feed, and bioenergy sector in Europe. FIFAC has shown its commitment to this ambition with our Feed Sustainability Charter 2030. This charter was released back in September 2020. As Angela already had mentioned, this is our sixth uh, charter webinar episode in succession, and it deals primarily with our ambition number two, this is to foster sustainable food systems through increased resource and nutrient efficiency. There are clear connections to other elements in our sustainable sustainability charter. 
also. As chairman, and uh, we should perhaps have the next slide now. As chairman of the Danish uh, National Bioeconomy Panel, I'll in this webinar provide a very short insight to a few relevant examples uh, from the work in Denmark. I hope this will serve as inspiration for the discussions today on our team, Circular Feed. The Bioeconomy Panel in uh, our country consists of 20 representatives from academia, NGOs, trade unions, associations, and private companies, and we have a secretariat. Uh, from six different ministries in Denmark. The next task for the panel is to provide recommendations to the government on the role of bioresources in green transition. This uh, job is directly linked to a Danish political agreement from the entire Danish parliament in October 2021 on a green transition of the agricultural sector in Denmark. I see here several links to the EU situation with the Green Deal commitments and the obligations towards EU private sectors, including our feed sector. Today, several sectors look for bio-based alternatives when they move away from fossil resources. This demand is becoming a big challenge to the capacity of the global biological systems. What role should biological resources play in the future while also contributing to biodiversity, environment, growth, and job creations. The recommendations from the panel shall focus on bioresources, biorefining technologies, incentives, and present various scenarios that can underpin future decision-making. Back in 2018, the panel launched a report with recommendations on how to improve the protein supply for food and feed. The report came with a very ambitious vision for the development of alternative protein products, as we said, with a better environmental and climate footprint, but also products that can match existing protein products regarding price and quality in key market fields within feed and food. This gave rise to an increased investment in research and innovation and in a lot of concrete actions by private sector. We can look at next slide. This uh, includes uh, improving production and biorefining of proteins from different sources, such as grasses, which have a very high focus in uh, our country, of legumes, insects, and sources of maritime origin. For grasses, including clover and alfalfa and legumes, further advances in plant breeding and in processing technologies are essential. Another example is the capture and recovery of nutrients from side streams, for example, potato uh, proteins from the starch industry. Next slide, please. In the report, it was estimated that these three tracks could provide 300,000 tons of proteins annually, equal to about one third of the total Danish import of soy. It is around 1.7 uh, million tons, but in straight proteins, about, about 900,000 tons. Since 2018, we have observed a relatively large increase in these productions into commercial size. Therefore, the Danish industry have now handed in our recommendations to the Danish government for a national protein plan, and based on actual developments and productions in the feed sector, we have provided a strategy on how to improve the Danish uh, feed uh, protein balance with more than 340,000 tons per year in 2030. I think such cases serve as inspiration when we talk about circular feed and at the same time uh, towards uh, uh, lowering the footprint from our feed uses and from our feed production. And then next, next slide, please. Hopefully, today's webinar gives the kickoff signal to collectively explore the opportunities as a growth towards an adapted EU regulatory framework is long. It's important to be mindful that besides the safety considerations, 
there is also an important market acceptance dimension. If we believe there is a potential in what is presented today, we need to collectively want this. Otherwise, it will not work. I look forward today to hear from aspiring value chain partners of the feed industry, as well as Dr. Martin Scholten from the Wageningen University on how we can reach the next level in the use of circular feed. I thank you once again for your participation and uh, now I hand back to Angela. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ashburn, and, and for giving us um, a glimpse of the Danish experience. Uh, and let's move um, on to the content of our webinar. So first, um, we'll have a keynote speech on the concept of circular feed. And then we will move to four case studies that serve to illustrate the approach. And they will cover um, algae, insects, um, former foodstuffs and phosphorus recovery. So first, may I introduce and welcome our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Martin Scholten from Wageningen and Aarhus University. He is a scientific advisor in transitioning towards a green and sustainable circular agri-food system. He was General Director Animal Sciences and Research at Wageningen University, and amongst many other roles, the first president of the European Public-Private Livestock Innovation Platform, um, the Animal Task Force, and also co-chaired the Livestock Research Group of the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. So, Dr. Scholten, I'll hand over to you, and there will be an opportunity, a short period for questions following um, Dr. Scholten's presentation. Um, the floor or the screen is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for this introduction. And yeah, it is really uh, an honor for me to be invited by FEVAC. Uh, sorry. Uh, hopefully the techniques work. I hope the, 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 the presentation is, uh, is there. Um, uh, yeah, it's an honor for me to be invited by FEFAC to uh, uh, share with you my vision, my thoughts on the concept of circular feed. Uh, I think uh, more circularity is really needed for the future feed sufficiency. Um, uh, to start uh, my story, I bring you to the importance of a circular agronomics. Uh, uh, actually, it is all about how can we secure food security uh, within the planetary boundaries. Also, of course, within the healthy boundaries. But yeah, over the uh, uh, last decades, we have uh, uh, designed the food system uh, that really helped us in food security. Uh, uh, the, the Green Revolution brought this food system where we have focused on production efficiency to maximize the production. And actually we used standard top resources, uh, a little bit of overuse of these standard top resources to maximize the production. But with more and more food production in the world, uh, uh, we also face the uh, counter side of that and that we need the resources for the food production and the resources that we are using becomes limited, becomes depleted. Uh, uh, yeah, we have spent a lot of energy on food print reduction, uh, but uh, uh, from a, a very segregated uh, uh, agricultural system uh, focused on a couple of commodities with as high qualities, uh, uh, safety and, uh, and, and secure food. But I think nowadays it's more and more about resource sufficiency. Where do we find the resources to fill all the plates, resources from only one planet Earth with more and more plates to feed on this planet Earth? And actually the situation around Ukraine also uh, 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 gives us uh, the, 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 the realization that resource sufficiency is so important for the food security. Food security and resource sufficiency are two sides of the coin. They, are, they should be in balance. It's not only about whether we should focus on food security or whether we should focus on the resource sufficiency. 
it is uh, fully linked up. And that's already a circular thinking. But the only way to come from the green revolution to the blue economy is by uh, circularity, using circular resources also in our agri-food system. Circular resources that secure us to, to produce food with zero waste. But circularity also requires a food system that is really interconnected, a food system that is profitable, a food system that is healthy. Circularity in agri systems means that we have to find uh, alternatives for the common resources that we need, common resources to fertilize our crops, and common resources that we use to feed our animals. And sometimes I see uh, the idea that the food system should be towards more and more plant-based production rather than, uh, uh, but, but, but for circularity, that's not, not the way to go. Actually, it all starts with, uh, with, with land and soil. Soil is the basis, uh, a rich soil uh, is the basis for uh, a rich production, uh, water and nutrients and sunlight. But then it comes to, to the crop production and the crop production, uh, uh, how can we best make use of the crop production? And in the crop production, actually, we only use 30% of what we are producing in, in, arable, in agriculture, arable agriculture, ends up as food on our plates. 70% is wasted, not only wasted as food, but also wasted on the acre, in the post harvest, etc., etc. We also have land where we cannot produce food crops only. And uh, uh, then we not using the land mo uh, most optimal. So actually the upcycling of, of, of plant material by animals is, is important also to make the circle round. And by the way, animals also produce manure, and manure is a circular resource for fertilization of our land. So the cycle is only around when it is land producing crops, producing livestock, producing manure, bringing to land, producing crops, which of part of it is being uh, made uh, upcycled to food by livestock producing manure. That is the cycle like the natural cycle outside. There is no natural uh, ecosystem without animals. But the animal production should be based on circular resources. And actually the feed industry has an important task to come up with sustainability in our agri-food system from a system perspective by finding the ways to circular feed. So I will not go in detail on the management of manure here this afternoon, but I will focus on the circular feed. And actually, it is a way of thinking beyond a classical feed versus food competition. It's not about feed or food. It is about an optimization and balanced way of feed and food or food and feed, so to say. Going beyond the feed versus food, uh, by thinking of the optimization of our agri-food system. And actually, I'm very proud of the science that we have and, and young scientists that come up with uh, a, a, a thesis like feed sources for livestock recycling towards a green planet or upcycling uh, 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 in a circular uh, agri-food system. But I'm also very proud of two uh, 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 platforms, technical platforms in Europe, European platforms, Animal Task Force, uh, uh, together with uh, Plants for the Future, uh, that came up uh, last year with this uh, 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 crops and animals together to address the food and nutri nutrition security. It's really a message that, that you really need both sides of the coin to come up with sustainability. 
it brings, uh, 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 but that brings in the picture that we have to find the circularity in feed sufficiency from a much wider range of resources that we are using now. That we have to explore the possibilities that, that nature brings, that biomass brings. And we have to realize there is much more biomass fit for feed than we traditionally think uh, uh, we have. As of course, we have the uh, feed crops and we have the, uh, 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 the, the, the byproducts of, of the uh, food processing. Um, uh, that, that we are using standards. And, and of course, 50%, 60% probably of all the animal feed is from a circular uh, uh, perspective, uh, a circular feed. But the other 40% is not. And we need these, uh, we, we need to find the ways to provide sufficient feed for our uh, uh, food production. Uh, refined roughage, uh, as Björn already told about the, the research in Denmark, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I'm also working in Denmark and, and seeing what kind of, of things there is, uh, is, is being uh, uh, developed, but refined roughage really brings uh, uh, ingredients out of that roughage into, uh, uh, in, 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 into the play. Actually, roughage is, is, is a big biomass source in Europe and across the world. Another one is the, is the food crop leftovers. For instance, sugar beet uh, in, in, in only the Netherlands. But the, the, the biomass of sugar beet leaves is, is, is enormous. And in Europe, it is the biggest biomass source you can think of. And the sugar beet leaves are full of proteins, like grass is full of proteins. And if we can refine that, if we can take it out of, of the leaves, uh, and, and, and then we have a, a, a protein source that can, can match the protein sources like the, the, the soy import in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, but also when we think about the sustainable cropping uh, with mixed cropping systems, where we really use the land in uh, 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 stripes, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, the, the, the mixed crop uh, systems in, in time and space. Uh, that can be the mixed cropping systems where feed and food crops uh, can grow together, can grow after each other and, 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 and make the maximum use of the, of the arable land in, in this way. So making use of all the biomass that grows on land but only 30% of our world is land and the other 70% is sea. So also looking at the crops from the sea is, is, is a good perspective. The sea weeds are really uh, uh, an enormous, uh, interesting source to produce animal feed. But also the other way around in this circle, the, the food system uh, and the food processing system it's on not only the, the byproducts that we are already using, but also the food leftovers that can be reused. Also the swill, probably not directly, but swill indirectly where uh, lignin is being, broke, uh, is being uh, reduced by, by fungi or where the swill is converted by insects or worms into uh, uh, um, an, in, an important uh, 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 feed uh, resource uh, ingredients. I'm, I'm very happy that, that this is all the scope of this afternoon's webinar. Um, but I also want to say that, yeah, this is all available, but it's only available when we are really using our uh, highest intelligence on uh, feed processing technology to uh, uh, come with uh, precision feed, with high nutritious feed, with high quality feed, with safe feed from all of these resources. We cannot go to the past by feeding the animals, the resources that, uh, that were there. Yeah, I realize that we have animals, uh, we have the cows, we have the pigs, we have the poultry, uh, uh, because these are so good in recycling and upcycling of, of all kinds of biomass. But in the 21st century, the feed industry can provide a high professional 
uh, a precision feed for the animals. But it also requires a cooperation between feed industry and breed industry, because probably the breeding calls, the trades where we breed for, should also be with a focus on livestock that is fit for upcycling circular feed. Now we only have the production capacity and the food conversion rate towards uh, uh, maximizing the productivity on the basis of top resources, top feed, uh, uh, to, uh, and, and, and therefore we have the top breed. But probably the next generation of top breed is the ones that are really the circular breeds to cope with, to be aligned with the circular feed. So in the Netherlands, we have a Feed for Future program. We have a Breed for Food program where the science and the industry works together. And, 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 and yeah, this is a program that we have already now for a couple of years where we really uh, uh, engage the breed industry to come up with, uh, with the breeds that are uh, good for circular uh, feed. But also, of course, the way how we house and manage the livestock with uh, a precision farming is uh, necessary to find the optimum. And this brings me to my, uh, uh, almost my, my last one, but very important one. Why is circularity so important? Why is uh, uh, circularity leads to sustainability in a balanced optimization of plant and animal based uh, 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 production? Uh, well, th this, this, this model says that, and, and in this model, the red uh, line is, the, is, is actually our existing agri-food system, agri-food produ producing uh, uh, system. Uh, and there is a connection between plant and animal-based uh, 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 production in that agri-production uh, 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 system. Uh, in this line, it says how much uh, ad, uh, proteins you can uh, produce per hectare of land without the depletion of the productivity and the biodiversity. The lower the, the, the point on the red line is, the more optimal it is, the less land you need uh, to produce, the less resources you need to produce, so to say. And uh, you see that the star is the optimum, the most optimum sustainability. And that is about when we have uh, 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 one fourth of our uh, food production based on, uh, on, on animal production and the other 75% on, uh, on plant-based production. But there is a, a bend in this uh, graph. It is not a linear one that we know from the LCA type of calculations. When you not only looking at food production chains, but a food production system, you come to other insights. But much more important is the green line. You see that in the green line, the bottom end of the, of the, the, the bend in the graph is at almost twice as low level. This means that the sustainability of our food system, the big leap towards sustainability in a food system is introducing circularity in it. The green one is optimization of circular resources, both for fertilization and for animal feeding. This situation can only be created when the balance between animal-based food production and plant-based food production is 50-50. This is a warning that it's not only moving towards plant-based uh, 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 food uh, uh, leads to sustainability, that's the right point eh? when, 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 when you think, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the argument why you can say more plant-based food production is better for the environment, but much better for the environment is a mixed uh, uh, agri-food uh, system. Um, uh, so I always warn that, that we should not uh, uh, have a too short focus in the red line, but we have to really move to the green line. But then animal feed industry has an important role to play. 
this is my last slide. I'm, I'm very happy, uh, but uh, actually I'm, I'm very happy to uh, tell you that, uh, that I see uh, around me uh, uh, people working very hard on coming up with another way of, of, of looking at sustainability of animal production based on animal feed and, and, and the sustainability uh, performance of, of animal feed from a resource sufficient uh, circularity perspective. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm not so happy that this is research in progress and that we expect only in two, three months the reports. I, I'd hoped that the reports were already available to present it here, but uh, it, it needs a couple of months more, but the Dutch Royal Agri Firm, the, the feed industry, is working on a fit for feed uh, 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 um, uh, characterization of all this kind of circular uh, uh, feed resources that we have on the world. And Wageningen University, uh, in, in perspective of the Feed for Future Consortium, is working on how we can uh, adapt our uh, 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 circularity uh, 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 management uh, support system for the farmers uh, with also information on the uh, 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 sustainability of uh, uh, circular uh, feeds in that uh, uh, circular uh, agriculture. So yeah, this is my uh, main uh, main message. I'm, 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 I, I hope that it is a, a sound basis also for the, uh, the uh, the case studies that 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 will come in this uh, webinar. Um, I'm open for two questions, Angela, if there is time for. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I think that's been an excellent um, precursor for um, our, our, the rest of our webinar um, today. Um, we do have um, we do have um, some questions. Um, the first question. Um, that we would like or a contributor would like to ask you, Bert Cornelius is, what do we reach first? A shortage on usable land or a shortage on usable protein? Hmm. Yeah, that depends on what, uh, what the land use uh, policy will, uh, will go into. We know the, the farm to fork strategy is saying that we have to give uh, uh, agricultural land to nature and we have to reduce the agricultural land and agricultural land use. We have a tendency to more extensification of the agricultural land use. And I fully understand these arguments, but we, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the right course to go and if this is the right pathway to go. Uh, if, if, if we understand that, that so much land of, of our planet and also in Europe is being used by agriculture and that this land has also potential to produce nature and to facilitate nature in agricultural landscapes, beautiful agricultural landscapes, high valued agricultural landscapes. I should say, let's try to move in another direction and, and see how we can come to an agricultural land use, which is good for an agricultural food production perspective and for a nature uh, 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 biodiversity restoration perspective and for an environmental quality perspective. And I'm, I'm sure that we can do that, but that we have to move then really to circular resources and moving to circular fertilizers, but also moving to producing circular feed. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I think there we, we really can uh, 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 better make use of, of the uh, uh, land. Uh, uh, so let's first move towards circular resources uh, to make uh, a better optimal use of the land so that we can showcase that uh, 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 sustainable land use within the planetary boundaries uh, uh, can be sustained uh, uh, with the food security uh, 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 challenges that we also have. And I think uh, in, it's, it's a very actual discussion because we have the discussion now in Europe. Uh, shall we uh, uh, stop the, 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 the green ambition uh, to make sure that we have enough resources and food? Or uh, 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 shall we find a way to uh, to to come out of this, uh, I think, from a scientific point of view, uh, uh, 
and I'm, I understand the political uh, dialogue and the political dilemma and the political uh, opposition, but I think from a scientific and ecological perspective, there is no need to uh, uh, choose between green or, uh, or, or, or food. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for that, that answer. Um, I just wanted to pick up um, another question that's come in or an element of it. In terms of achieving this circularity and, and feed circularity in particular, what do you think is, is the biggest challenge? You've talked about collaboration, you've talked about technology, you've talked about stretching the thinking, um, it could be legislation. Um, what, is, what is the thing that we, we really must overcome in order to achieve um, the endpoint and the vision that you have? Yeah, I think in, in, in the, the, the key beyond the transition is, is, is that we have to follow four paths uh, uh, parallel to each other rather than, uh, uh, yeah, technical innovation is important, but also the uh, uh, economic feasibility of, uh, of, of the new practice is important. Uh, uh, the uh, societal uh, acceptance is important and the regulation is important, should all be uh, uh, transformed to uh, uh, enable the, the transition that, that, that we are all striving for. Um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it requires uh, 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 an open mind, uh, an explorative uh, uh, way of thinking, an integrative and inclusive way of, uh, of thinking, uh, an interdisciplinary way of, uh, uh, from a scientific perspective, an interdisciplinary uh, approach. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I really hope that uh, that will be reflected in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the research programs, also in, in the Horizon uh, Europe program uh, for, for, the, for the later years, that will be more and more supportive towards this kind of uh, transformative uh, innovations. Um, is, is, is this an answer to your question? Uh, for, for, the, for the feed industry, I should say, open your mind and do not uh, uh, say, uh, well, we've tried it uh, 20, 30 years ago and we cannot do it. Uh, we have the knowledge. We have so much knowledge to uh, uh, un, 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 un close to uh, the, the, the potential that is there in biomass. And if we strive for a bio-based society, uh, bio-based industry, we have to realize that we, are, we have to use all the biomass and all the pieces and bitches and learn from nature because in nature, it's also based on biomass. And there is all the pieces and bits are being used, reused and again used. And that's a sustainable way. No, thank you very much indeed. And uh, a good message for us in the feed industry and particularly for those of us who have been around quite a long time. So thank you very much indeed for that, um, that presentation to us and for answering the questions. Um, we have run out of time in terms of the Q&A session. I note there are some questions in the Q&A and we will endeavour to get those, those, those answered um, for you, hopefully. But just want to move on to um, the next part of our webinar, which is really the case studies. Uh, and these case studies... Um, have been chosen to illustrate you know, the real life opportunity to increase the capacity for nutrient recovery for feed for food producing animals. Um, we have three speakers from supplier industries who seek to use waste-based streams, insects and um, algae and phosphorus as mentioned, and also the former foodstuffs processors to share their perspective as well. So each supply industry will be given um, eight minutes. Um, and in that eight minutes, you hopefully will be able to hear a presentation of their, their projects, their process, uh, and the contribution to the circular economy, uh, the potential for its development, um, restrictions, especially regarding legislation, and also probably the feed safety challenges. Following these presentations, we will have a panel discussion for questions um, across all the subjects. So please um, put your questions into the Q&A as you have been doing. That's great to see and we'll hopefully answer as many as we can in that panel discussion. So moving very quickly to our first case study, um, I'm very pleased to welcome Christoph Trestberg, uh, who is chairman of the um, IPIF Working Group on Feed Hygiene and Animal Nutrition. 
um, a veterinar veterinarian, if I can say it by profession, and the co-founder in 2015 of Mutatech, um, an innovative French um, business um, producing the black soldier fly as an ingredient for feed. So with no further ado, over to you, Christophe, for your presentation. Thank you very much, Angela. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. So it should, should work. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, this afternoon, I'm going to give a short talk about uh, the perspective and the point of view of the insect industry uh, as regards this nutrient recovery uh, in my capacity as a chairman of the IPF working group on feed hygiene and uh, animal nutrition. So just to say a few words about IPF, uh, we have 79 members, uh, mainly from uh, European countries, from more than 23 countries, and uh, some non-European from uh, US, New Zealand, uh, and some other countries. Most of them, they are insect producers. We have as well some academic uh, players and uh, some equipment and technology providers uh, in, uh, as, as a member of the, of the IPF. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, today the insect production is a business reality uh, in Europe, and we are at a turning point uh, in terms of uh, growth and development. A couple of uh, plants are working today with some uh, production of a few thousand tons, and some uh, farms are under construction. Most of the companies, of course, they are small and medium uh, enterprise startup, some of them coming from, I uh, would say, more... Uh, uh, historical uh, segment like the biocontrol or the or the pet food uh, investments uh, have been quite uh, impressive over the past years with over 1 billion euro and probably should exceed 3 billion euro in, in a couple of years and uh, today we have created uh, 1000 direct jobs and more than 30000 jobs to be expected uh, within the eight uh, coming years uh, actually, what do insects feed on? So we are at the, at the, at the core of our topic. Uh, actually, uh, they, they, they contribute to boost the circular economy because uh, they are going to uh, somehow value uh, food stuff, food, uh, food waste from the agri-food industries, some byproducts, some leftovers, in order to produce some valuable protein products for the poultry, for the pig, for the fish and uh, high quality ingredients. And uh, actually, uh, this is some very often a kind of mix of those ingredients which uh, serve as a, a feed for, uh, for insects. So we can uh, say as an example, some uh, brewery grains with brown fruits, vegetables, and some uh, as well former foodstuff uh, like bakery products, biscuits, and uh, products of uh, vegetable origin. So um, uh, the, 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 somehow we are very much aligned with uh, circularity principle. And this is really the, probably the, the, the main reason why this, there is this uh, emerging insect sector, uh, generating a wide range of products, like, as I said, insect meal, insect fats, and as well the frass, uh, which is used, uh, the, the frass is, a, the, I would say, the, the dejecta from insects, which is used as a fertilizing product. And um, what I want to emphasize as well is that the frass, of course, cannot be used as a feed uh, uh, for, for the insect. So we are really in this uh, circular principle. And uh, of course, there are some uh, restrictions on the use of, uh, of the, the biomass. And uh, today we can use uh, only uh, the, bio, the biomass and the feed, which is uh, authorized by the regulation. So um, the, 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 would say the, the, the feces, for example, or the paps, they, they cannot be used. And as well, the former foodstuff containing meat and fish uh, cannot be used neither. So 
somehow uh, the, 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 the point of view of the IPF members uh, is uh, although the, 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 the EU regulatory framework is fit for purpose of our EU, uh, we believe that some EU regulation should be revised and uh, some regulatory opportunities uh, to be unlocked in order uh, to further unleash the growth of this uh, sector and to maximize our potential. Um, actually, uh, we have uh, we can address two key challenges with the insect sector. Uh, first of, firstly, uh, to valorize the food waste burden estimated over 90 million tons of uh, food wasted in EU, and as well to answer to the issue of uh, EU dependency on imported feed and food, especially protein uh, ingredients for animal uh, feed. So in addressing the growing global demand for protein, uh, insects farm generate local and sustainable solutions because most of the feed uh, are coming from a quite uh, close neighborhood of the, of the farm. Uh, what do we mean by former foodstuff and catering waste? Those are the definitions uh, given by the EU regulation. So that foodstuff, they are no longer intended for human uh, consumption. And uh, there are, of course, if we are talking about uh, former foodstuff containing meat and fish, they are of animal origin. And uh, somehow they are not intended anymore for commercial reasons or due to problems of manufacturing or packaging defects, for example, but they do not present any risk to public and uh, animal health. Some examples like the non-vegetarian form of foodstuff like pizza, tart sandwiches, ready meals as well, or canned fish uh, and meat. Catering waste is something different, it's defined by the uh, text 1422-2011, and this is all the waste food can originating from restaurant catering facilities and kitchens, including central kitchens and household kitchens. So our approach as an IPF is that we have two distinct pathways when we talk about those two uh, type of, uh, I would say, uh, biomass, and in terms of regulatory status and in terms of potential safety risk. Um, so we propose to valorize the former foodstuff containing um, meat and fish for insect bioconversion. Of course, there is an interest in terms of uh, environmental benefit, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, and as well, it is somehow financially sound because such products today, they are not uh, really uh, economically competitive and they are used in uh, energy uh, recovery, for example. So our vision somehow is being shared as well by the European Association for Former Foodstuff Processor, the FPA, uh, as it is uh, mentioned on this slide. Um, catering waste, uh, it's a different pathway, as I said before, and we consider it as a maybe more longer term, or as well, uh, we, we pay attention to the segregation, meaning that uh, we uh, don't intend to mix in the same farm, for example, uh, former foodstuff and catering waste. And insects products derived from catering waste could be as well valued in some specific uh, target market. Uh, actually, um, authorizing new feeding uh, substrate is a topic that has been already considered by a uh, European uh, Commission, as it is mentioned uh, here, especially in the context of the EU farm to fork strategy. So it is a topic that we have seen in the text, uh, in the words of the European uh, Commission as well during parliamentary question and in some technical uh, uh, EU uh, report. Uh, I would like to say a few words about the EFSA risk profile that was published in 2015 and which was a very important point for our industry, uh, allowing, uh, I would say, the use of, uh, finally, the use of insects for feeding uh, fish. Actually, what, what is said in this report is that somehow the microbiological hazards, they are expected to be comparable to the occurrence in other source of animal origin protein. So uh, provided that the feed you give to the insects are uh, complying with the regulation, there is no specific risk. And of course, the production methods, the substrate, the state of harvest, or uh, the methods for further processing 
will have a very positive impact on the management and on the control of the safety uh, risk. Um, actually, uh, I would like to stress the importance of the compliance to the feed safety risk management policy designed by the, um, uh, the food law, the 178-2002. And of course, within the IPF, we ask uh, all members for complying with that, and as well uh, to uh, respect good manufacturing practice and uh, best hygiene practices, as we recommend them in our guide. Uh, we have a guide on good hygiene practices and this document is going to be presented for final investment to the EU member state in the coming weeks. In order to uh, consolidate somehow the knowledge on the new feeding uh, potential substrate, uh, we have identified some research areas and within our uh, IP working group, we have some uh, uh, research program on, uh, for example, biological stability of those new substrates or specific uh, infectious diseases that may be transmitted. And uh, we work with academic players and we uh, insect on this type of uh, project. Finally, my last slide is to say that we have some uh, synergies, of course, with other players uh, of, uh, of this uh, circularity, let's say, in animal nutrition, like algae, insects, uh, yeast sector, and that are going to give some lecture today as well. And on different uh, aspects, we have some uh, uh, somehow complementarities and uh, cooperation, of course. I would like to thank you uh, very much, and I would be very pleased to answer uh, the question. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Christoph, um, for your presentation. Um, there are some questions which you may find in the Q&A to answer, and we look forward to seeing you join us again in the panel at the end of all the case studies. Uh, and so if I can move to case study number two, where we have two speakers speaking in relation to um, algae um, produced from manure. We have um, Floris Schutus, who is a biotech engineer gr um, graduated in industrial microbiology and a researcher at Thomas More University in Belgium, focusing on the use of wastewater to cultivate microalgae. And the second speaker will be Peter Blayen, who is a researcher at the Experimental Poultry Centre uh, in the province of Antwerp, obviously also in Belgium. Uh, and over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Hey, okay, good afternoon, everyone. So I will explain a little bit about the project we did together with the province of Antwerp, the Experimental Poultry Centre. And it's a project that aimed at making Flanders more circular by using a waste product, poultry wastewater, to cultivate microalgae. So it's a project between Radius and the uh, province of Antwerp. I am from Radius and Peter is from the Experimental Poultry Center. I will give a short introduction. So why did we aim or why did we do this project? We want to work towards a more circular economy. So we want to help in aiding the transition to a more carbon neutral and more resource efficient one. You do this by closing the loop of product life cycles uh, by up and recycling them or more importantly even reusing them it has benef benefits for both the environment and the economy so instead of making something using it and trashing it you want to really reuse it and never trash it so one idea that we had was to use waste products from poultry stables. When you clean the poultry stables you use uh, water and you get a type of liquid manure this liquid manure is actually rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. And these two components are the components that algae can use to grow. So we figured why not use this waste product, normally you have to pay to get rid of it, to grow algae, and then in return, use this algae as a feedstock or feed for chicken. So you can really close the circle. So how did we do this? Well, we started with a lab scale test. We selected a few algae with potential and we did a screening and we found several algae that could grow on, these, uh, on this wastewater. We tested a few conditions. We played with the concentration of the wastewater, um, sterile, non-sterile. And to our surprise, we were actually able to find a few algae that could grow very well in the wastewater. Of course, there is always a difference between lab scale test and uh, real life or pilot scale test. So the results in the lab, they focused on two or yeah, a few algae, but two in particular, Chlorella sorokiniana and Senedesmis oplicus. In the laboratory, Chlorella was the best one. However, when we scaled up, Senedesmis oplicus was the best one. 
the three pictures below show actually the progress of how the reactor look, uh, looked after a few weeks. So you start with the poultry wastewater, which is a brownish color. And after three, four weeks, you have a dark green color. Ironically, the algae actually grew better in the wastewater than in the mineral medium. When we did a quality analysis of the microalgae, this is based on the results from the lab scale test. We actually have a very similar product to commercial products. There are a few differences. For example, the protein content was lower because but this was because it was not optimized and we didn't give additional nitrogen. But in general, we had a quite good product. Interestingly also was that the pathogens, they were greatly reduced. reduced. Actually, we were within the limits for animal feed. However, there are still some legislation uh, hurdles, um, but Peter will talk more about this and will explain more about the practical um, yeah, experiments they did with the poultry or the chicken as, as such. Yeah, thank you, Flores. Uh, yeah, the next step in the project was to close indeed the circular loop. And this means that we would use the algae grown on the cleaning water from the broiler house in the chicken feed. But uh, yeah, the cleaning water from the poultry houses is considered as manure, and therefore uh, <clears throat> it is not allowed by the animal feed regulation to use materials derived from manure in animal feed. So therefore we bought for this particular feed trial, a commercial algae product, the Chlorella sorokiniana. And this was the same algae strain that was successfully tested in the previous lab experiment of this project. Next slide, please. Is it not, it's not going to the next slide, I think, or no. is it? No. No, it's strange, yeah. I, it's stuck, I don't know what happened. Maybe some, maybe the organization can share the slides. I don't know why it's not. Uh... I can try again to see if it works, but. No, it's, it's stuck. I, I am not able to move my screen anymore. Shall I share my screen? Yeah, maybe you should, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, they are already sharing, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah that's the right slide. You wanna put it in the presentation mode? Yeah, thank you. So in the, the feed trial, there were three different feed uh, treatments, a control mesh feed, and then a control feed with 5% and 10% of algae supplementation. So we use the starter, a grower, and a finisher feed in each treatment. And the chicks were the Ross 308 uh, broilers, and they were divided per sex in 12 pens of 20 animals each. So you can see in the picture below that uh, the color of the feet changes because of the algae supplementation. Next slide. So in the next two slides, you see some pictures of the experimental setup of the feed trial with the different cages. Uh, the feet and the water were at libitum available in the suspended feet and water buckets. Next slide, please. And also after each uh, phase transition and the day before slaughter, all the chickens were weighed uh, manually. Next slide. Uh, in the technical results, we saw a lower feed intake by an increased algae supplementation. But in fact, uh, the supplement, supplemented uh, algae product was a very fine powder, which could have had an effect on the feed intake especially with this quite high doses of five and 10% of algae powder. So because of the lower feed intake, also the daily growth and the life weight was lower with the supplemented feeds, but we saw no difference in feed conversion 
between the treatments, which confirms that this algae strain has a nutritional value for broiler feed. Also the daily water intake and the feed water ratio, they were not significantly different between the treatments. Next slide, please. We also uh, checked the feather cleanness and the feet and hock lesions of all the chickens during the trial. And uh, we saw no significant uh, differences between the treatments. So that also means that the little quality was okay for the treatments. That means the dry content and the looseness of the litter. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, what was quite remarkable in this trial was the correlation between the amount of algae supplementation and the discoloration of the chicken feet, as you can see in the picture. Also in the abdominal fat, we saw this effect, but not so clearly. And yeah, the discoloration is probably uh, due to the carotenoids, uh, which were in the algae. Next slide, please. So as a conclusion of this project, we can say that there is a potential for algae biomass production on poultry cleaning water as a growing medium, and even as a manner of waste water treatment since nutrients in this water are removed. <clears throat> we also see that the pathogenic microorganisms are reduced and that the heavy metals are under the legal threshold. So based on the feed trial, we see that algae biomass potentially has a value for animal feed. Next slide. But actually we are faced with some legal obstacles and, and questions. As already mentioned uh, in this presentation, based on the animal feed regulation, the algae grown on poultry cleaning water are not allowed to be used in animal feed. But also the absence of knowledge on algae within the legal framework is something that should be taken in consideration. Besides the legal aspect, the, the high setup cost and the current production costs hamper the use of microalgae in feed for poultry and pigs. But microalgae should not be considered as a bulk protein product for animal feed, but we have to look for the benefits of the functional ingredients of microalgae. For instance, in order to reduce the antibiotic usage and also to produce healthy animals. And maybe byproducts of algae fractionation uh, are also a valuable alternative uh, in animal feed. So, uh, thank you for your attention. And yeah, if there are any questions or remarks, <clears throat> remarks about uh, this project, feel free to ask us after the next presentations. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much to um, Floris and, and to Peter, and also to the um, to the backroom staff that sorted out the technology. Thank you very much to them. Um, so moving on swiftly um, to our third case study, uh, and the next is in relation to phosphorus recovery, and we once again have two speakers. So to introduce them, um, firstly, Sarah Steenstrom, who has a PhD in environmental science and is the product manager at Easy Mining. Um, her goal is to create new circular material flows in an efficient commercial way. And secondly, Chris Thornton, who is manager of the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform, which is a gathering of 150 organizations focused on phosphorus management and sustainability in Europe. Thank you very much and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I will start and then I will hand over to Chris. So I will share my screen first. So I hope you can see it now. Um, so closing the phosphorus cycle, uh, that is the focus of my uh, presentation. And I really think that this is circular economy for real. Uh, at Easy Mining, we focus on closing nutrient cycles and this is production for the future. Uh, we have several projects up and running, um, but uh, we have phosphorus uh, that I will focus on today, uh, phosphorus extraction from sewage sludge ash. We have um, salts extracted from fly ash, 
Uh, we have a process uh, to make monoammonium phosphate uh, more efficient, uh, also from ash, um, and also a project called nitrogen, where we recover nitrogen from liquid waste streams. So let's jump directly to uh, from sewage sludge ash to a clean feast feed phosphate. So um, with this phosphorus uh, recovery, we add uh, the missing piece and we allow this to be a collaboration and we create circular economy for real. And I would like to point to two things in this slide. Uh, first, the wastewater treatment plants. They should actually be called resource plants because they have many resources and we should be better at taking care of them. And I know that Chris will talk more about this. Um, then the second point I would like to make is the incineration, uh, which has a really bad reputation today, but it actually is a great way of decontaminating different waste flows. And I think in the future, this will actually be needed because we get a great raw material, the ash that we can use. And in this incineration, um, you destroy all the pathogens in the sewage sludge, you destroy the organic contaminants, the microplastics, and so on. So this is a great way of detoxifying. And then we can do the rest of the, detoxify the, the detoxifying the heavy metals in our process. If we look at the phosphor product that we uh, recover, it's a precipitated calcium phosphate. Um, you see here in the picture, it has 17% phosphorus, 35% calcium, and it's really pure. If you look at the table below in dark blue, you can see the typical values in the PCP, the precipitated calcium phosphate, compared to the li limits in the legislation for feed. So um, it's actually really pure. It has almost no contaminants. So this uh, feed phosphate, uh, we know that it has a lot of CO2 savings. It's a really sustainable product. It's fully soluble in citric acid. And as you saw, it has almost no contaminants. And that is because we also have this really good decontamination in the process. So we can take away the heavy metals. The digestibility um, has been tested on pigs and poultry with good results. You can read more about the results on our webpage if you're interested. But here again, um, as the other ones also uh, spoke about in the other examples, we have a legislation barrier. So again, it's regulation 767-2009 that really puts a stop to our innovation um, because products recycled from sewage sludge uh, is not allowed to be used in animal feed today. Uh, which I think is, is uh, we know why, but now we really need to change. So the way forward would be to open this legislation and try to focus on quality instead of origin, because we know, for example, that our product is safe. We have done all the tests required and we can show really high safety and it works on animals. I also think that we should think about other legislative incentives for the production industry for example, quota systems to really go from a push to a pull in the market. And finally, I think it will be super important to make ash a safe starting point in the manufacturing chain to be allowed to use that as a raw material. Um, and so that would be really needed to close the phosphorus cycling um, with sewage sludge ash to a feed phosphate. Uh, thank you so much. And I would hand over to Chris. Hello, so I'll share my screen, hopefully. Yep. Can you see my screen? See my slides? Yes, that's good. Good, cool, okay. My name is Chris Thornton from the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform. Uh, we bring together a range of companies in different sectors, research institutes, public authorities to promote sustainable manage management of phosphorus 
and that includes recycling and also increasingly we're working on recycling of other nutrients because the synergy and it fits together. So for phosphorus, there is a significant potential for recycling in Europe. So much, well, nearly all the phosphorus that we eat in our food ends up in sewage sludge. In Europe, something under half of that can be considered to be recycled today because sewage sludge is digested or composted and then used on fields as a fertilizer. That recycling may not be 100% efficient and it does have to be very carefully managed because of the contaminants that Sarah mentioned. But there's also a significant potential of sewage sludge which today is incinerated and then the ash ends up in landfill. There's phosphorus in a range of biodegradable solid wastes such as food waste, um, food industry wastes, and a significant amount of phosphorus in various animal byproducts and particularly meat and bone meal. So there is a significant potential for recycling phosphorus there. The biggest potential source of phosphorus is manure. And as you can see from the figures, the amount of phosphorus in manure in Europe is actually higher than the amount used in mineral fertilizers. But of course, again, much of that manure is to some extent recycled when cows or livestock are in a field. Um, not always efficiently because cows will often shit in the stream or shit around where they drink or move to the lower land in mountains. Um, so they don't necessarily redistribute the nutrients where they're needed within the field, but that's another problem. But a lot of manure is also in concentrated livestock production where it's effectively not recycled because the, the livestock production is concentrated in Europe and the land around the livestock production doesn't need the manure. So some figures on the recycling for nutrients. These are tons, so it gives less idea of the potential compared to the, the table before. But there are significant potentials for recovering phosphorus um, from municipal wastewater and also nitrogen. Recovering nitrogen is very much in its infancy in the past. Nitrogen, the technologies um, remove it from wastewater to prevent eutrophication, but put it back in the air as N2. But with an increasing pressure, obviously, on natural gas and energy prices, and also an increasing pressure on ammonia emissions and N2O emissions, which contribute to climate change, there is a clear wish and development to look at how to recover the nitrogen from sewage works. Another potential route is through algae production. So using partially treated sewage to feed algae and then extracting the algae, extracting the materials from them. For phosphorus, as I've said, there's a very similar potential from animal byproducts. And in that case, preferably via ash in order to ensure complete safety after incineration but also potentially from food waste or food industry byproducts, um, either directly in the case of some food industry byproducts or after maybe digestion. The potential from manures is much bigger. And there is also a potential for recovering potassium, for instance, from solid municipal waste. And Easy Mining is developing a process and has got a first installation doing that. So the routes for recycling nutrients from various streams, which I call wastes, including manure, although technically that is not a waste under most regulations, to animal food. There are a whole range of routes, but the key is to ensure safety. So the important is not to directly use the wastes as an animal feed. And you'll have seen in the discussion that that is a rather blurry line. If you spread manure on a field and then grow clover using the manure as a fertilizer, no one really criticizes the fact that you can use the clover as animal feed. Um, indeed, 
cows actually eat the grass in which they spread their own manure. But at the same time, if you're using manure to feed algae, then it can be argued and is considered by some regulators that that is processed manure. And the same discussion for sewage sludge because the animal feed regulation includes the same exclusion of sewage sludge, however it's processed. So there's a range of chemical or inorganic mineral recovery routes, which basically should ensure safety because the product is being chemically processed. It's hard to see how you can have pathogens in there. But even then, there is a need to look at it very carefully. So a typical one is nitrogen recovery from ammonia stripping from digestates. So you take something like sewage sludge or manure, put it into an anaerobic digester. The aim obviously is to produce methane and so recover energy and also to stabilize the waste so it can then be um, handled more easily and you avoid emissions. When it comes out, most of the nitrogen has been converted from nitrates into ammonia because of the oxygen deprived conditions in anaerobic digestion by definition. And you can strip the ammonia out of the liquid into a gas form um, by putting air through it or by a vacuum or simply letting it stand there, heating it up a bit. And then you put the ammonia through an acid like sulfuric acid, you get ammonia sulfate. Now, the question is, are the pathogens, um, you might think this is okay because you're stripping a gas, but actually the ammonia that comes off is not really a gas. Much of it is in water droplets. If you can get ammonia in a water droplet, can you get a prion? Um, so the safety does need to be looked at carefully. If you're then putting it in through sulfuric acid to produce ammonium sulfate, then probably you're going to get rid of the pathogens. So these chemical recovery routes, um, and particularly if they're after incineration, should be safe, but in some cases, if there isn't incineration in the chain, then you do need to check that there are no pathogens there. And work is ongoing on that. It's ongoing in the new EU fertilizers and products regulation, where you also need to ensure safety before you spread something on a field. Um, not least because after you've spread it on a field, livestock might graze on it. But it also needs looking at carefully um, by EFSA to ensure that safety is ensured. Um, the other main routes are the use of organic waste streams to feed, for instance, algae production, which we've talked about, or aquatic plants such as um, duckweed, or potentially terrestrial plants, or directly to, produce, to, to feed microbes to produce protein or to feed insects. And in all those cases, you clearly need to look at the safety to ensure that the insects or the microbes or the algae are processing the waste and are not accumulating either contaminants like heavy metals or contaminants such as pharmaceuticals or indeed pathogens. And also obviously you need to ensure there's no cross-contamination in that if you're growing algae in manure, um, clearly, you need to wash them carefully. Now, that may sound, sim may sound obvious, but it's not simple. So there are a number of interesting routes, and many of them pose regulatory questions which were not really anticipated when the regulations were written and on which we're working. And I know that others around the table are working to try and ensure that the regulations are adopted to make circularity possible, but to ensure safety. So what does ESPP do? Communications, bringing people together, and then particularly a, a significant amount of work on regulatory obstacles to recycling. So one example on which we are working is indeed in animal feeds, working on safety um, with EFSA. Excuse me, Chris, yep. I'm, I'm really sorry to inter interrupt you, but we are just running a little yep. short of time. So if you could sure. just it is quickly the do your last two slides, I would really appreciate it. It is the last... Slide. Many thanks. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> and we're working on a range of policies which support that. So secure 
circular economy, critical raw materials, and the EU taxonomy, which will be important because that will fund green investment funding, even though the word makes it rather incomprehensible. So that's basically what I wanted to say. These are our members, and thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed um, to, to both of you for um, the discussion on, on phosphorus um, recovery. And, and just to our, our last um, case study for this afternoon, which is um, Alexander Rom, who is Vice President of the European Former Foodstuff Processes Association. Um, he is ch also chair of the Dutch Association and Vice Chair of the German Association. In his business life, he is the Chief Material Management Officer for Feed Valid. And I think we're just swapping the presentations in the background to be able to get... Alexander, I can see you're on the screen. Are you able to join us um, with... Yes, you are now unmuted. Look forward to um, your contribution. Yeah. Okay. Sean is putting it on the screen. Very good. Um, first of all, uh... And Sean wants to go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me introduce uh, EFPA. EFPA is the European uh, Form of Foodstuffs Processing Association. Uh, next slide, please. EFPA was uh, founded in 2014. Uh, it represents associations and companies in Europe, Canada, and the US. Our members uh, possess former foodstuffs for food processing animals. And EFPA has a clear circular vision of food change towards more sustainable animal food systems. And we are an associate member of FIFAC. Um, I would like to show you a video that gives a short impression of our role in the food and feed chain. We should be working towards a circular bio-based economy with an increased use of alternative animal feed materials and more sustainable, carbon-efficient livestock production. Food manufacturers always consider donations to food banks for food that is not placed on the market. But in the production of some food items, a small percentage end up being no longer suitable because it is broken, misshaped, incorrectly flavoured or just unfinished. But it is still suitable as animal feed for food-producing animals. In line with the food recovery hierarchy, the animal feed outlet prevents food waste from occurring. These so-called form... I think the video didn't went uh, quite that well. I suppose we will send uh, the link uh, again to uh, uh, all the, the, the people that joined, uh, that joined this webinar. Can you... We should be working towards a circular bio-based economy with an increased use of alternative animal feed materials and more sustainable, carbon-efficient livestock production. Food manufacturers always consider donations to food banks for food that is not placed on the market. But in the production of some food items, a small percentage end up being no longer suitable because it is broken, misshaped, incorrectly flavoured or just unfinished but it is still suitable as animal feed for food producing animals. In line with the food recovery hierarchy, the animal feed outlet prevents food waste from occurring. These so-called former foodstuffs are collected and transported to a processing facility where they are mixed, blended and dried if necessary with any packaging material removed. Controls are performed to ensure the feed safety and quality standards of the processed former foodstuffs are met. Pigs, cows and chickens are very happy to receive feed containing former foodstuffs because it's very tasty. Plus, it's an excellent energy source due to the high quality sugar, starch, oils and fat content. Approximately 3.5 million tons of former foodstuffs are used as feed in Europe annually. This amount in cereal grains would require nearly 400,000 hectares of arable land and over 300 billion litres of water. Using former foodstuffs in feed increases feed sustainability and supports efficient food production and a low-carbon circular bio-based economy. 
For more information on how former foodstuff processors contribute to safe and sustainable food systems, please visit the EFPA website. So, uh, former foodstuffs uh, processing is in the heart of the food circular economy. Yeah, we collect the former foodstuffs from manufacturers like bakeries and the retail sector. Products are after collection converted into animal feed. This conversion can take place via several processes, all in mind to produce safe animal feed with constant nutritional values. Next to Next to that, operators are often a buffer between supply and demand. The processed animal feed is delivered to the feed mills or directly to farms where the products are mixed into compound feed or a total feed on the basis of recipes. Next slide, please. Oh. Yeah, that's the right one. Um, in the picture, you find the waste hierarchy from the European Commission Circular Economy Action Plan. The activities in the green label prevent food waste, in the red products are classified as food waste. On top of the hierarchy, it all starts with prevention, via, for example, optimizing production in the food chain. When there's overproduction, products should be brought to the food banks. When products are no longer intended or suitable for food, the product should be converted into feed. The reason that food is no longer intended for food purposes can be that they are very, uh, that they are, for example, misshaped or wrongly packed. By keeping former foodstuffs in the feed chain, high nutrition are not lost and therefore food waste is prevented. Extremely important when you look at the total contribution of food production in general and the amount of greenhouse gas emissions it causes. Some members of FPA made life cycle analysis studies. The outcome of those studies uh, was that the carbon footprint of those products uh, produced by those members is extremely low in comparison to standard commodities like wheat. Those studies were validated and can be found in the GFLI database. Next slide, please. What could be done more? Uh, what are the key elements to get more products in the circular economy and prevent food waste? Next slide, please. There's still a potential volume of former foodstuffs suitable to convert into animal feed uh, at many food manufacturer level, at warehouse level, at retailers level. In many cases, more effort in the separation of products is necessary, which should be done via training of personnel. Public and or private efforts should be made to support the retail sector with the organization of residual flow streams. This should ensure the safety and integrity of potential former foodstuffs. Clear separation of former foodstuffs and products not suitable for feed is in the end not enough. Former foodstuffs must be treated as feed material from the basis. Every part of the chain should take responsibility and make the effort to preserve former foodstuffs for safe feed. Therefore, there must be an awareness of the feed use of former foodstuffs. Food producers and retailers should realize that in, the, in that sense, they are also suppliers. We should develop an holistic business approach facilitating feed use of former foodstuffs. Retailers, food processors, and former foodstuffs processors are in chain partners for sustainable food systems. In some cases, the effort to be done are quite high, uh, but it helps other chain partners further in the chain. By stepping over their boundaries and by looking at the complete picture, a lot is possible. There are already some nice examples that have been developed or are in development. Uh, examples like Kipster, uh, Zondwarke, Oranjehoen. Also, uh, other initiatives take place. Uh, a retailer that develops circular hobby laying hand feed uh, in cooperation with feed mills and a form of food stuff processor. Potential outcome should be a substantial increase in available volumes of farm food stuffs. Next slide, please. The use of feed processed from former foodstuffs in feed formulation is one of the key elements in a more sustainable feed sector. 
uh, life cycle analysis shows a big decrease in carbon footprint when formal foodstuffs are used. When the products are used in the most optimal formulation in the feed, the decrease in carbon footprint is even higher. Many of the, of the products are, for example, baked products and therefore very suitable for young animals. In this way, processed form of foodstuffs contributes to fostering demand for cereal grain feed alternatives. This gives a decrease in the use of limited resources. The feed industry can assist with its professional development and stress the high sustainability level of feed produced from form of foodstuffs. Feed has the biggest impact on carbon footprint when you look at the total carbon footprint of pig and poultry products, meat and eggs. And to achieve the climate targets that are set, it's also necessary to make feed chains more sustainable. Food business should therefore support the food in feed industry in selling the benefits that formal foods have, have in reducing the environmental impact and improving food security. Also there, the potential outcome tackle market obstacles for former foodstuffs that limit their use in compound feed manufacturing and highlight the contribution to a less impacting animal feed diet. It therefore contributes to a more sustainable animal food production. Next slide, please. At policy level, that can be done. Food and feed autonomy is again an important topic. Therefore, prevention and Reduction above other usage should always prevail. This means policy safeguard measures should be taken to avoid the deviation of potential form of foodstuffs to the bioenergy sector due to energy related policy making. The prevention of downgrading products must be a top priority, enforcing the primary responsibility of the food manufacturing and food retail sectors to prevent food waste, therefore discouraging the downgrading of potential form foodstuff to residue or waste status for bioenergy purposes. Potential outcome, keeping food losses within the sustainable food systems. Next slide, please. A summary of what we can do. Our sector is preventing food waste and keeps high nutritional elements in the food and the feed chain. Therefore, we reduce the use of limited resources like soil, water, and fertilizers. This makes it possible to produce milk, eggs, and meat with a much lower carbon footprint. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Alexander. And um, now we'll, um, we'll move to our panel discussion, um, which hopefully we will all appear by magic. And we have one um, additional member to our panel, uh, and that will be um, Vito Vedello, who joins us, who is General Manager of the European Algae Biomass Association. And he is also Director of the Portuguese company um, A4F. So I think... Um, I think we have everybody back available to answer questions on the screen. Um, we have had some questions already answered in the Q&A, um, but we'll try and um, pick some out that can be uh, answered by all the panelists. Um, and one of the very early questions that was asked, uh, and you referenced it in your presentation, Alexander, was about the energy cost of the process. Um, you referred to the LCA and the product environmental footprint. But there's a question to the, the um, the other um, uh, industries as to the, the energy cost of their processes. Um, so perhaps if we were to move in the order in which you presented, and if I can move to, to Christoph first and then through the, um, um, the various um, industries. Have we got, or anyone? Oh, hi, Christoph, yes. Yeah, yeah of course it's, um... It's a, I would say, a very important question. Uh, uh, we have seen a, a couple of uh, studies on that and LCA uh, studies. Um, actually, the, the, the results of uh, those studies, especially in terms of uh, energy cost, uh, focused on the processing of the insects. Uh, actually, the the farming, the breeding of insects and the reproduction, they can be uh, somehow uh, managed uh, without much uh, energy cost because it's very much optimized and the insects 
they produce uh, energy, uh, they produce the heat. So uh, the, the, the main point of uh, progress is on, the, on processing. And uh, at this early stage of the industry development, we still have, I would say, um, improvement that can be done, of course, with the scale up. And uh, this is one of the, I would say, of the, of the important topic that all the members uh, are, are working on. Uh, because all, all the rest is uh, somehow so much uh, virtuous in terms of sustainability, because we don't use land, we don't use water, and we valued some existing resources. So this is, uh, I would say, probably the, the last point of, uh, of, uh, of progress in terms of LCA. Thank you. And moving um, to, to Algi, and, and either, um, is that Doris or Vito who would want to answer that? Voice, please. Oh, I can see some delegation going on here. Uh, I, th I think it's a difficult question, to be honest. Uh, there is a lot of research going on, but it's often academia oriented on smaller volumes. Um, to really make a, to really answer the question, we need more data on pilot scale or com even commercial scale setups. But the problem is, of course, companies who are already doing it. They often see it as a company secret. So in my opinion, it's, it's, it's difficult to answer it at the moment. But maybe Vitor has another idea. Yeah, I, I just told that that, that um, currently everything is focused in the, the production level, not yeah. the, the full uh, process. Um, the LCAs are focused in the uh, efficiency of the production itself, not the... the the full scale uh, until the consumer from the production to the consumer that that i think there is no study about that no uh, yeah i agree yeah. Oh, okay so well thank so you it's for... not covering the value chain yes. it's only one slide of the value element. chain yeah uh, i'm just um, just giving sarah and chris uh, an opportunity to answer sarah yeah i can start shortly by saying that i think we have already been overshooting the planetary boundaries uh, for phosphorus, so we need to, to really close the loop and not add so much more phosphorus, that's one thing. And LCA is, is not the answer to everything and definitely not only measuring energy or CO2 emissions, so I think that's really dangerous. And again, the decontamination, I mean, how do you put the value on not adding decontamination in the circle over and over again. What will that cost in the future? So I'm really hesitant to do LCAs, but we know that our product has much more CO2 savings than, than, than Virgin Mind, but that's not the, the full answer. Chris. Yeah, I, essentially the same answer. I think the, the energy somewhere along the lines it's positive because if you're avoiding virgin resources you're avoiding energy consumption in extracting them you then have processing but on the other hand most of the recycling of nutrients the main objective of processing is not necessarily the nutrient recovery it is to avoid phosphorus getting into the environment and contributing to eutrophication which is an obligation under the eu water policy or with nitrogen, it's avoiding ammonia emissions, which are limited under the emission ceilings directive because they create air pollution problems and particles, or it's avoiding N2O emissions, which are a major greenhouse effect or indeed methane emissions. So it's rather like anaerobic digestion. Um, it, doesn't actually make sometimes that much sense if you look at it on its own. Installing an anaerobic digester in a sewage works, sometimes you look at it and go like, why bother? But in the end, you've got to do something with the sewage. You've got to treat the water. You've got to treat the sewage sludge. You've got to stabilize it. So if you can do that and produce methane, even if the quantity of methane you produce in the end is used up in the sewage works in its own energy consumption, you're still making a net energy saving and you're contributing to other objectives. So I think that's where a lot of it is going. And the important thing is finding recycling paths, which 
achieve that synergy between recycling resources and being, of course, energy efficient. And the current pressure, which due to the current deeply regrettable events in Ukraine, we are now under mean that phosphate rock import is already a critical raw material and will become more critical because Russia is a significant supplier. And as we all know, natural gas has now gone into a spike, a price spike situation, which is causing major social problems and which means that any route for producing nitrogen fertilizers without using natural gas by recovering nitrogen, which has already been fixed into organic materials, is clearly going to be a, a route forward. So unfortunately, and with deep regret, it's going to significantly accelerate this. And I would much rather it wasn't being accelerated by the current events, but it is. So thank you for those um, those answers. And um, we are um, somewhat limited on time, but we've probably got um, one more question where I'm looking for probably a three word answer to make it very precise. And, and you've talked about scalability and limiting factors. I know, Alexander, you've talked about some, but just in three words, what are the most critical limiting factors for scalability in your particular sector then? I'll go to Alexander first, because you had a very good summary of them all, but what's, what's the most critical? Yeah, so I've mentioned quite, uh, quite some in, uh, in, in the presentation. I mm. think uh, uh, awareness is, uh, is very, uh, very important. And what we see at this moment, uh, the threat of uh, policy making around the energy sector, that's another important one that we should, uh, should uh, really consider what, what policy is doing there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to um, to Christoph. Three words, please. Um, you're only allowed three. Yeah, it's not not that easy actually. Um, That's more than three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, regulation probably is the one I mentioned earlier. We have to uh, uh, be able to uh, get new access due to regulation. Okay. So the second one is substrate. Uh, yeah the former food stuff and uh and probably uh, the third one is uh access to the market okay no thank you so regulation substrate access to the market excellent um over to um you are muted now we don't hear you i am muted so over to algae <laughs> I think it's, it's similar. Uh, it's legislation, access to market, and yeah, maybe money. It's expensive to start large yeah. facilities. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. No, thank you. That's that's interesting. And, and finally, to um, to Chris or Sarah. Yeah, it's it's the legislation. We're building the plants now, so please open the legislation so it's open <laughs> when they are finished and we have the phosphorus. That's it. <laughs> I think that's a plea more than anything else, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Um, um, maybe maybe I would say two things: safety, because that in the end will drive consumer and regulator confidence, and regulatory push to funding. So I mentioned the EU taxonomy, um, but there are other financial tools. The market price has got to be right. So at the moment it's right for nitrogen recovery, but we all know that these spike peaks tend to be spike peaks. So it needs long-term financial stability. Yes, no, thank you very much. So I am going to draw the panel to a close because we literally have only a couple of minutes before we finish um, but to thank them very much for their contribution. Um, and this is a really important subject for the feed industry um, in, in, the, in the opportunity to be able to exploit the technology of circular food. And it's not new, you know, it's in the feed industry's DNA to exploit secondary materials. Um, but we also have a history and a history of crisis in terms of issues, you know, meat and bone, BSE, swill, foot and mouth, um, recycling of, of medical waste affecting swine infertility. So as you, many of you have mentioned, feed safety is really, really critical to us and has to be paramount. Um, 
Uh, and that means that safety for the animal, safety for the consumer, safety for the environment and the performance of the animal. Um, we need responsibility, you know, we're at the boundaries of two worlds, waste and feed. And we need operators and regulatory authorities that understand both. Uh, we need transparency of the whole process so we can understand everything um, that's going on. Uh, and a point that has been certainly been mentioned is we need to make sure that we engage consumer acceptance. Um, but these are not barriers for me, um, that they're, they're enablers. They're enablers um, for us to achieve um, a vision of circular feed that I think excites the industry very much because they like taking it forward and they like that challenge. So finally, I would just like to thank all of you who have presented, um, all of you who have participated and contributed. We will endeavour to answer your questions, and this will be um, put together by FIFAC into a publication, the output of this webinar, later in the year. So thank you very much, um, and farewell. Thank you, Walter. Bye. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You.